Hello and welcome to another edition of Community Forum. My name is Joseph Feaster. I am the host of the program. Today I have a program which is one which I enjoy doing. It involves a lot of technology and of course it involves uh, today two distinguished guests which I have uh, one in the studio and one by Skype who is sitting in Israel. And this is a program with Ambassador Yoram Ettinger and Rabbi Jonathan Hosman from Ava Torah Congregation here in Stoughton. But before I introduce my guests, I just want to put this in context. We're going to be talking about what is going on in Israel, Israel's relationship with the United States, Israel's relationship in, with other countries throughout the world. We're going to be talking about what's going on in the Jewish community here locally, uh, internationally, because I Rabbi Hausman also has some international relationships as well. So I'm going to get started because I want you to hear from our guest, and so I want to introduce them at this time. Uh, first and foremost, I want to introduce uh, to you, who probably doesn't need an introduction, he's appeared on this program previously, Ambassador Yoram Ettinger, who was the Israeli ambassador from 1989 to 1992. Uh, he is the founder of the Ettinger Report. He is a consultant and speaker on U.S.-Israeli relations. He has served, uh, he deals with real estate, he deals with group uh, with investments. He's just an all-around person, really knows this issue, and I'm excited about having an opportunity to uh, conversate with him today. And uh, I know it's in the afternoon over there, Ambassador, so I want to say shalom to you. Uh, and I also want to introduce my guest in the studio with me, Rabbi Jonathan Hausman, who has been the past, uh, the rabbi, obviously, I'm going to my Christian faith, but he is the rabbi of Ava Torah Congregation for the past 22 years, extensive involvement with the Jewish community locally and nationally and internationally. So again, welcome, Ambassador, uh, welcome, Rabbi, to Community Forum. Uh, Ambassador, I, you know, as we've always done in the past, I always like to give folks uh, some history because they oftentimes don't know much about the, the, the state of Israel, and I wanted to be able to give them that. So I'm just going to start with a brief history, and then we'll get into some of the issues which we think are relevant uh, for us to discuss today. For those who don't know, it, uh, the state of Israel was created on, on, in May, on May 14, 1948, out of the League of Nations. Uh, its current president is Reuven Rivlin, if I pronounce his name correctly, and he's been president since July of 2014. The current prime minister is Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, he has been the prime minister since March of 2009. The legislature in the state of Israel is the Knesset. Um, the current Israeli ambassador is Ron uh, Derma, uh, and he's been uh, the uh, Israeli ambassador to the United States since December of 2013. And the current U.S. ambassador is David Friedman, and he has been the ambassador since May of 2017. So hopefully, I've, uh, if I've emasculated any of the pronunciations of names, I, please forgive me. But nonetheless, let's get started, Ambassador. Uh, you know, you've had a distinguished career. You've had a distinguished background. I read your publications from the editor group uh, reports. But one of the issues that has been much in the news and has created quite a bit of controversy was the United States decision in order to place its relocate its embassy to Jerusalem. Let's talk about that from its impact, its, you know, the utility of doing that and right, is it a good or was it a good decision? Well, uh, the U.S. decision to relocate the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem has served America's interest. It has served America's interest because it has sent a very clear and very forceful message that unlike the past, the U.S. now is not deterred by Arab pressure or threats by Islamic terrorists to refrain from relocating the embassy to the capital of the Jewish state. 
uh, such a decision, such an action uh, enhances the U.S. posture of uh, deterrence, which is very, very uh, critical for U.S. not only national security, but primarily homeland security. Uh, moreover, uh, for the U.S. to relocate the embassy to Jerusalem also sends a message to Arabs that they have to accommodate themselves to reality. And unlike the recent past, where American presidents joined Arabs in non-recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of uh, Israel, and therefore forced the Arabs, forced the Arabs to outflank such rejectionist position by the U.S. from the radical side, this administration has sent a message that as far as this administration is concerned, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and that sets a new frame of uh, action for the Arabs, uh, because for them to outflank the U.S. from the maximalist uh, side would not be as radical as it used to be in the past. But maybe equally important, recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of uh, Israel also is consistent with the history of the U.S. The early pilgrims who came to the U.S., the founding fathers of the United States, all of them considered Jerusalem to be a very major link in their own worldview, in their own vision. And that's the reason that while we have in Israel one uh, Jerusalem, uh, in the U.S. you have 18 Jerusalems. And in addition to 18 Jerusalems, uh, towns and cities named Jerusalem, you also have 32 Salems. Uh, Salem is the original biblical name of Jerusalem or Shalem in, uh, in Hebrew. The interesting thing, 18 Jerusalems, 32 Salems, comes together to 50, the 50 states in the Union, but maybe equally important, uh, 50 is the number of the years of the Jubilee. And again, going back to the early pilgrims and especially the founding fathers, they considered the biblical Jubilee to be their pillar of fire, role model of what liberty is all uh, about. And here we have compilation of issues which have to do with the foundations of the U.S., which focus on Jerusalem, let alone, let alone and last and not least, the spelling of Jerusalem, at the heart of the spelling is U-S-A, yeah, J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. And therefore, relocating the embassy to Jerusalem is consistent with and serves America's best interests. Well, amb Ambassador, you're never one to uh, 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 not be able to tie up all the loose ends, but let me just be a little, do a little bit of pushback so that we can uh, get, and uh, obviously, our Rabbi, I'd like you to join in this discussion as well. We know that, that the move by the U.S. government in order to relocate the, uh, the, capital, the embassy from Tel Aviv to, uh, which I visited, as well as Jerusalem in the past, uh, to Jerusalem has created a, uh, an uproar of controversy from the Arab community. And secondarily, as a, as a religious site, uh, uh, so many religious sects claim Jerusalem from a religious standpoint. How do we get, how, how do you reach an accord with both the political implications of that as well as the religious implications of, of that move? Well, first of all, we have to be realistic. Uh, we should be realistic, realizing that life is complicated, uh, full of conflicts, and we should not, we should not sacrifice essential values on the altar of avoiding conflicts, avoiding uh, confrontations. Uh, uh, when, when it comes, when it comes 
to uh, for the U.S. to confront opposition to its position, to its uh, policy. Uh, U.S. should pay attention to uh, a very important element in the Jewish tradition, Jewish history, and the old sages used to advise us that the rougher the opposition, the more important is the mission. And uh, yes, uh, for the U.S. to decide to face Japan and to face Nazi Germany, it required the U.S. to go through war. But that war was essential in order to avoid enslavement to Nazi Germany and to the rogue regime in uh, Japan. And uh, it seems to me that global democracy, and especially the leader of global democracies, USA, must maintain their posture of deterrence, not shying away from confrontation against forces of evil, if we want to maintain our democracy and for the U.S. to maintain its well-deserved leadership. Rabbi, you know, would you like to speak to that issue as well, as far as that relocation? Uh, certainly. Uh, first of all, you have to put things... I, I agree with everything the ambassador said. In addition, you have to put things uh, in, into national perspective. I mean, the United States is, is re-engaging in the Middle East uh, from a more, much more forceful position, and number one, that that has to be considered, uh, this U.S. re-engagement in terms of its national foreign policy and our national interest. Number two, you have several of the states in the Arab world considered to be pro-Western and not just pro-Western, but uh, allies of the United States. And, and they see, they take a look at this move from a much different view, okay? They see they see the more dangerous issue on the horizon. And for them, that issue happens to be Iran and the Iranian projection of power, okay? So when you talk about controversy in the world, it's very interesting. The amount of protests that took place from these pro-Western Arab Sunni regimes was exceedingly muted. Um, and indeed, I would say that it, it was, in, it was pro forma to be, more, to be more candid than anything else. And these are regimes that, um, you know, off the grid, I suppose you would say, are having uh, not, not just informal relationships with Israel, but deepening relationships with Israel too. Because Israel also sees the projection of Iranian power uh, and that kind of radical power a, as an existential issue as well. You know, uh, in, terms of, in terms of the protests that were taking place, I think we saw uh, more opposition from the European Union and specifically Western European governments than we saw coming from, you know, many of the countries and governments in the Middle East. Well, you, uh, it's a nice segue to my next topic, and I want you both to address that, because let's talk about Iran. I mean, the, the U.S., there was an agreement that was entered into with Iran during the Obama administration. I know that Israel was not happy with that agreement uh, at that particular point in time and, and, and voiced its opposition to it. The, the agreement went forward with much uh, uh, claim by the Western European countries as well as the United States. And now under the Trump administration, they have, pull, they have pulled out of that agreement and et cetera. So the question, and Rabbi, you've mentioned it, and I'm, I've had previous conversations with you, Ambassador, about the threat from Iran. Let's talk about it in the context of that change now. We now have an agreement that has been uh, uh, rent asunder, and so now we have a situation where it could be a free-for-all. What's the impact of the Iranian situation? Ambassador, I'd like to hear from you, and Rabbi, I'd like for you to comment as well. Well, when it comes to the 2015 agreement with Iran, uh, it was an agreement which served in a tremendous manner uh, Iran's uh, vision, namely the rogue vision of the rogue ayatollahs of uh, Iran. Uh, that agreement was signed irrespective, irrespective 
of uh, Iran's subversion and terrorism uh, against every single pro-American Arab regime in the Persian Gulf, in the Arabian Peninsula, throughout the Middle East, intensification of rogue uh, Iranian activities in Africa, in Asia, and even in, even in Latin America, and uh, very close to the boundaries of the United States. While the agreement was signed, Iranian military uh, assistance was heavily involved in trying to surge into Saudi Arabia from uh, Yemen. The U.S. decision to pull out of that very, very self-defeating uh, agreement sent a message to the Ayatollahs that they cannot count any more on getting something tangible and significant in return for plenty of intangibles, insignificance, verbal promises. And again, verbal promises by a regime known for its disrespect for agreements, disrespect for human rights, disrespect for Western democratic uh, values, and hopefully, hopefully, more and more Western countries are going to join all pro-America Arab countries which have applauded the U.S. Certainly, hopefully, Europe will join Israel as well in forcing the Ayatollahs to change themselves fundamentally if they wish to benefit from the largesse of uh, the Western world. Rabbi? Well, and, and on top of all of this, um, the, this agreement was negotiated more or less as an executive agreement between the prior administration, the Obama administration, and Iran. It was never a signed agreement. Iran never signed this agreement. And if it was negotiated as a treaty, it was never submitted to the United States Senate for approval. So th this is what ends up happening if you negotiate these kinds of agreements. Uh, don't submit it through the appropriate constitutional processes to enshrine agreements like this. They can be discarded willy-nilly, just like the Trump administration has done. Um, and then everything else the ambassador said is absolutely true. There are the enforcement, the inspection, provisions of, the, uh, of this agreement were basically non-existent. Iran could, could close off, prevent inspectors going to just about any, into any research facility that was uh, identified in Iran. Um, if you're going to have an agreement that prevents nuclear proliferation, it needs to be a solid agreement that prevents nuclear pro proliferation. Well, you know, again, I, I, I'm not a studied expert in this particular area, but I do, uh, I do read up on, the, on, on what is reported in the news. And there are many countries, particularly in Western European uh, countries, which are lamenting the, the U.S. Uh, pulling out of this agreement. And so it, it's, it flies in direct conflict of what both Ambassador you and the rabbi are saying with respect. There are reports that I've read, and it, as I say, with any issue, you can, you're never going to find unanimity in totality. So the question is, you know, w which is correct? Some say that they were, uh, Iranians were following through on what this agreement was, and others uh, say that they were not. Uh, which is it, if, you, if well, either of you can address that? Listen, it's very clear, okay? With, with the treasure trove of information that Israel was able to spirit out of Iran, you know, a few months ago, uh, back in January, Ambassador, I think it was back in January, <laughs> you'll correct me if I'm wrong about that, okay? It shows that Iran was living up to none of it, oh, almost none of its commitments by way of this agreement. Uh, and number two, look, yeah, you know, the United States has to, has to approach foreign policy from U.S. national interest. In the same way that European powers will approach it from their own personal uh, respective national res uh, perspectives, okay? And Europe is taking a look at how this affects the, what they see growing economic ties and business ties 
that Europe would have in Iran specifically, and it endangers all of that stuff. It endangers all of it, from oil exploration to uh, manufacture of motor vehicles to all kinds of sales and, and uh, other industrial agreements. Ambassador? Yeah, if I can add, uh, the agreement itself was severely flawed. It was the best agreement that any rogue regime could ask for because irrespective, irrespective of the debate, whether the Ayatollahs uh, fulfilled uh, their, uh, their commitment or did not fulfill their commitments on the development of nuclear capabilities, the agreement never dealt with any of the conventional right. threats posed by the Ayatollahs to the stability of the Persian Gulf, stability of the Arabian Peninsula, stability of the Indian Ocean, of the Middle East at large, and beyond, but most importantly, the clear and present and lethal threat posed by the Ayatollahs to vital American uh, interests. Uh, that's the reason, by the way, that the former, the previous administration did not want to submit the agreement to a vote in the Senate because they knew once there is a vote, it requires certain hearings and the, the hearings would expose the damage caused to the U.S. by such a faulty uh, agreement, which was shaped by the Ayatollahs themselves and endorsed by the former administration in Washington. Last and not least, the agreement of 2015 eroded severely the U.S. posture of deterrence. That's the worst news for America's homeland security when you are uh, when you benefit from an eroded posture of deterrence. It's the worst news for allies of America in the Middle East and beyond. At this stage, the U.S. is tested. So far, the current administration in Washington has abandoned the agreement but has limited itself to what I would call statements and verbal position vis-a-vis -vis the Ayatollahs. The allies of the U.S. in the Middle East are awaiting to see if in addition to the solid talk on Iran, it will be followed also by solid walk on uh, towards Iran, which would send a message to the Ayatollahs once again that they have to abandon the fundamentals of their ideology, the fundamentals of their curriculum, hate education, the fundamentals of their geostrategic steps in the Middle East. The Ayatollahs must not benefit from Western commerce and trade and loans and, and uh, uh, material benefits while their machete is at the throats of the Saudi regime, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, Jordan, Egypt, and other Arab allies of the United States. And, and I think, and, and just to finish this piece up, at least from my perspective, uh, if you take a look at what's happening in Iran today, you know, there's a lot of civil disobedience that's taking place. There's a tremendous amount of um, anti-government agitation taking place. And I think that this happens to be a bit of an overflow, an after effect of the abandonment, the United States rejecting the JCPOA. Because mm -hmm. it's just said, you know, the United States is not backing this authorita authoritarian repressive regime and, and we will stand behind uh, any kind of domestic um, uh, a domestic effect to try to ensure some governmental change in Iran. Just for, just for the viewing audience, JCPOA? That's the, that's the official designation of the agreement okay. uh, that was negotiated by the Obama administration and the malocracy in Iran. Okay. I want to stay on this topic from the standpoint because I think it's important for us to ex address the 
uh, U.S.-Israeli relationships, and, and, and we do it in a time sequence. One, uh, uh, it is, is not a mystery that the relationship between Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, President Obama was not a good one. Uh, the issue are the changes in the in uh, seemingly uh, well not seemingly demonstratively in the Trump administration two accords one pulling out of the Ar Iranian agreement but also most recently um, the Supreme Court supported the uh, the the Trump administration's ban on certain uh, uh, Islamic countries uh, Arab countries in terms of their persons coming from there being able to enter the United States. Can you both speak to those two, uh, two issues? Uh, like I said, it, was, it is no mystery in terms of the relationship that did not exist uh, between the Prime Minister and President Obama. Ambassador and then uh, uh, Rabbi. Uh, you, you mentioned President Obama, and it seems to me that that's the best indication of how productive and healthy have the relations been, because it was known that the relations between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu were not very cordial relations. However, during the tenure of President Obama, U.S.-Israel relations have expanded in an unprecedented yes. manner, because what has been at stake is not the attitude by President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu towards the Palestinians, towards the Arab-Israeli conflict, towards Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, or towards Jerusalem. All those issues paled, pale compared to the real, what I would call, uh, NBA League type of issues facing the U.S. in the Middle East namely Iran, the stability of the pro-U.S. Uh, uh, Arab regimes, the potential threat of Russia and Chinese and North Korean interest in the Middle East, all those interests are, have been much more important than the disagreements over the junior league uh, issues. And to the credit, to the credit of President Obama, and the U.S. administration at this time, they were smart enough from the U.S. point of view to ignore to an extent their disagreement with Prime Minister Netanyahu over the lower uh, scale issues of the Palestinian issue, Jerusalem, and other such elements. When it comes to the current administration in Washington, obviously, we have many less disagreements, and therefore the atmosphere is more cordial. But once again, presidents who criticized in the past Israeli actions on the Arab-Israeli uh, front were smart enough to leverage the real potential importance and contribution by Israel to vital geostrategic interests of the U.S., whether those are commercial issues or national security issues, recently counter-terrorism issues, those are the reasons for the very, very close ties between U.S. and uh, Israel. Rabbi, if you, if you will, if you'd like to comment, uh, you know, please do. Um, you know, in a moment, but I also would want you to add into that conversation because I think you gave a segue once again, Ambassador, to the fact uh, the U S foreign aid to Israel has not diminished during out even a time when there wasn't this love fest between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu. So my sense is that, as you said, on the critical issues of importance, there has been alignment, but on the minor, on what we would, none of them are minor, but on the lesser issues, uh, we, while there may have been uh, some discord, the reality was that the relationship from a foreign, foreign aid standpoint never diminished. Would that be an accurate statement? I would think from, from my perspective, that is an extremely accurate statement. Um, again, as the ambassador said, notwithstanding any kind of personal issues uh, that President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu might have had one to the other, 
Uh, you had not just, you, you had increased counter-terrorism uh, discussions between the two countries and agreements between the two countries, incredible economic ties between the two countries. And indeed, if you take a look at a lot of the uh, advances in medicine and technology, okay, flowing from Israel, Israel punches above its weight, incredibly so. And it's mutually beneficial to the United States to be involved with a lot of this stuff. And in terms of, in terms of aid to Israel, the aid is not so much economic. The aid is really military aid, okay? And, and the 10-year agreement that was negotiated under the Obama administration was greater than the previous 10-year agreement that just expired. Okay, now there are, there are some conditions in terms of how that money is spent. Most of the money has to be spent here in the United States, okay, for research and development, for R&D, not in Israel, okay? But still, whatever comes out of that benefits both countries. And, and indeed, if you've taken a look at some of the news reports, you find out that the Adir, okay, which is the F-35 manufactured for Israel, you know, has had its, its first experiences in combat. Okay, now how does that affect how the United States changes the kinds of developments and input into the F-35 in and of itself? You know, Israel, again, Israel punches above its weight, far be above its weight. This country of eight and a half million people, look, look at what it did in terms of medicine, in terms of technology, in terms of all, all these kinds of things. Well, I was impressed when I was there, the agricultural, in the, in the desert, I've never had that conversation with the ambassador. The agricultural aspects are even in a desert. And, and right, and take a look at how that kind of development benefits the world in its entirety. Okay, the, what happens in terms of drip technology Okay, for agriculture in Africa and South Asia, okay, with populations explosion, explosions. Okay, take a look at what's happening with the uh, decreasing water resources in several areas of the world. Okay, and what Israeli development and technology in terms of desalinization can do. Okay, Iran is, is facing water Armageddon. Okay. Prime Minister Netanyahu went over the heads of the mullahs, okay, and appealed directly to the Iranian population and said, we can help you. What other country in the world does something like that? Ambassador. Well, in fact, uh, at this stage, the U.S. and Israel uh, cooperate, as they do on many other issues, in bolstering the pro-American uh, regime in Amman in uh, yes. Jordan, uh, while we collaborate in uh, helping that regime in counter subversion and terrorism, Israel has undertaken to provide all water requirements to almost two million refugees from Syria who have, have uh, moved into Jordan and potentially they could threaten the stability of Jordan. Israel was asked and complied to provide all water requirement at the time, by the way, when Israel is facing severe drought and not for the first uh, year. Israel is facing severe drought while natural waterfall has been at an all time low for the last 10, 20 years. And while the natural waterfall is, uh, is an, at an all-time low, our population has increased 11 folds. However, water reserve are at an all-time high, which supposedly defies logic. If natural waterfall is an all-time low and population increases 11 uh, folds, then how can you have all-time high uh, water reserves? And the reason we have all-time high water reserve has to do with the Israeli irrigation technologies. We are today the number one country in the world as far as recycling sewage. 75% of our sewage is recycled for our agriculture. And it is recycled in a quality which has reached the level of human consumption and therefore we can avail our water to Jordan, to 
refugees from Syria. And as was indicated by the rabbi, we have also proposed it to be transferred to Iran as well. But as you know very well, not in Massachusetts, but in the western part of the U.S., in the southwest, there are regions which are vying for water. And as we talk here on this show, there are Israeli irrigation experts in some of those regions alleviating the pressure by sharing with American experts the Israeli experience in utilizing uh, in a non-conventional uh, water resources. And last and not least, we do exactly the same thing and much more so when it comes to the U.S. defense uh, industry. Uh, U.S. uses its defense industry to defend the homeland, to fight terrorism overseas, and providing Israel with the best of the U.S. defense industrial products. However, Israel is using those products such as combat planes, such as tanks and missiles and missile launchers, and we share with the developers and the manufacturers in America the lessons we draw from operation and maintenance and repairs. According to all experts of U.S. defense industry, those Israeli lessons have contributed to the U.S. defense industry mega billion dollar every single year, which by far, by far exceeds the total sum, which is erroneously referred to as foreign aid. The U.S. does not provide foreign aid to Israel. Right. The U.S. invests in Israel, and that investment bears a rate of return, which is roughly five or six hundred percent every single year. This is the best investment ever made by the United States. Rabbi? Yeah, and it goes to, it, 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 this also goes to clean technologies, as we used to hear from the previous administration. If you go around, right in here in Massachusetts, take a look at the solar technology use and whatnot. You know, the, I, we, my family and I were out uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we passed, I would call it a solar farm, and you saw how the sun traveled across the sky with this little swivel on, on the solar panels. That all comes from Israel on top of everything else. Well, the interesting part, and, 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 and you know, as we, as we continue to have this discussion, I, I think you and the ambassador must have looked at my notes for the program <laughs> before I came here because there are a lot of these things which yeah. I think are important for our viewing audience to have and to know. You know, it, it, well, good, so we all did our homework. That's right, all right. that's right. Um, Warren Buffett has said that the best investment the United States can make, that any company or any person in the United States can make is to invest money in Israel. This is Warren Buffett. Well, I, I know in a previous program, uh, Ambassador, we talked about what IBM did in terms of investing in. I read about the economy, uh, in uh, the growth economy in Israel is like going to be 3.9, 3.8% this year. Uh, but I also, getting back to Israel's involvement and influence even beyond its borders, I was reading recently that uh, Israel has been granted the right by Egypt for airstrikes against terrorist organizations in Egypt. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because I found that to be interesting because in the general geopolitic, a lot of people would believe that that's an impossibility uh, when you go back to the accord in, um, in 1978, uh, 19, da, 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 uh, well, in earlier years, I don't have the date right in front of me right now, when we had the Israeli uh, and, and Egypt accord. Uh, but again, I, I found that to be interesting that that was occurring because it's more or less been quiet. It has not been something that's been talked about. If you can, Ambassador, if you and the rabbi could speak to that for a moment. Sure. Uh, the, the current regime in Egypt, uh, headed by General Sisi, uh, recognizes the Middle East for what it is. And the Middle East is a can of uh, terrorist worms uh, going after every single so-called moderate Arab regime, pro-American Arab uh, regime. Uh, General Sisi in Egypt, just like the Hashemite regime in Jordan, just like the House of Saudi in Saudi Arabia, just like 
the sheikhs uh, ruling Bahrain and Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Oman and Kuwait, they all have realized, just like the U.S., that the most effective life insurance agent in the Middle East happens to be Israel, because Israel has the capabilities, Israel has the reliability, Israel also uh, benefits from the trust of its partners. And therefore, when it comes to fighting anti-Egyptian Muslim terrorists in the Sinai Peninsula, which is an Egyptian territory, but ridden by multitude of anti-Egyptian Islamic terrorists, Egypt knows turning to Israel for cooperation in fighting those terrorists is the best deal they can uh, make. Uh, we have disagreements with Egypt over the Palestinian issue. But the Egyptians know, just like the Saudis and the Jordanians and the rest of them, that contrary to the so-called elite media in the U.S., which assumes wrongly that the Palestinian issue is the a core cause of Middle East turbulence, it's a crown jewel of Arab policymaking, those Arab leaders know that the Palestinian issue is not a core cause of Middle East turbulence. They also are aware of the terroristic, subversive track record of Palestinians against almost every single moderate Arab regimes. And therefore, they have no problems working with Israel in facing the Iranian threat, in facing the Islamic terrorist uh, threat, and that hopefully will send a very, very educated signal to some of the leading columnists in the U.S. as far as their own erroneous reference to the Middle East at large and the Palestinian issue in particular. It's very simple. Israel does not threaten existentially. The, the governments in the countries of Egypt, Jordan, uh, Abu Zabi, and all the other countries that the ambassador has mentioned. Doesn't threaten any of those countries existentially. Iran threatens them existentially. The Ikhwan, okay, and ISIS and all those groups threaten these countries existentially. So policy differences aside, these countries, very quietly, for the most part, are very happy to have Israeli help. And that's the thing, again, and I'm, I, I, I'm glad that I came upon that nugget of information as I was doing my research because, quite frankly, it's not reported in, you know, and f for good reasons maybe it's not, but there is a, if you will, a, 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 a funneling of information so that you don't know broadly. Now, maybe there are other places where this information comes out, but it definitely was news to me. But I want to come stateside once again, because I want to come back to the Supreme Court's recent ruling with regards to the travel ban that was uh, uh, thwarted uh, by lower courts uh, with regards to the Trump administration's travel ban policies. And while a narrow vote, five to four, so it wasn't a, you know, uh, uh, um, um, well, it was a narrow vote, I just call it for what it is, on the question of, of uh, having a travel ban for certain Arab countries, persons coming from certain Arab countries. would like both of you to comment on that, if you will. Well, I don't know if you know this, but I used to work for the U.S. Department of Justice and the Immigration Service as an attorney. I did, I did not know that. Okay. Well, now you do. Now you <laughs> the do. world knows. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Look, look. It, it, first of all, this was not a Muslim ban. Let's start with that. Okay. There were seven countries that were mentioned in, in, this, in this ban. Okay. You have five countries that are basically Muslim countries, and on top of that, you have Venezuela and North Korea. Yes. Okay. So that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, the Immigration Act that was quoted as part of, uh, as the reason for this, gives the president great discretion, okay, to determine um, who can and cannot come into this country, okay, by country on a country, person by person and country by country basis. 
This is not the first time that uh, a president of the United States has issued blanket bans for categories of people and classifications of people for coming into the United States. Roosevelt used this, okay, Obama used this, Trump's now using this, okay. Um, the countries that are listed have many issues with regard to the information that their government agencies can provide to the United States with regard to the safety and security of the people who want to enter into the United States. And that's basically what this came down to. Um, if you take a look at the original list of considerations of countries, the original list of consideration of what countries, it expanded somewhere of, of around 35 nations within the world. That was pared back and pared back and pared back because in negotiations between the U.S. government, this administration, and those particular countries, enough, enough agreement was, was made, okay, uh, with regard to what information could be provided to the United States, all right, to, to ensure the safety and security and, and the national integrity of the United States itself. These seven, these, these seven countries were a problem, and they continue to be a problem. So you're talking about states like Venezuela, like North Korea, like I mean, you can Iran, okay? Yemen and, uh, and Yemen. Yemen. I, I mean, Yemen. There is no functioning government in Iran. Yemen. Okay, uh, Iran. We know about Iran. Right. In Iraq, listen. Yeah. While there have been elections in Iraq and whatnot, what kind of functioning government though do you have in Iraq, or in Syria for that matter? So, Ambassador, do you like to comment? I agree with everything with, that the rabbi said, uh, and I think that the bottom line is that American president has to choose between wishful thinking and reality. It's wishful thinking to ignore the terroristic elements throughout uh, the Arab world, uh, many of the Muslim uh, countries. If you ignore it, you pay heavily as far as homeland security, and the decision, I believe, has been based on very, very sound intelligence findings and assessments that those countries which uh, have to do with the uh, travel ban uh, have potential major, major terrorist threat uh, to the homeland security in the United States. I have a lot more of the... Uh, Israeli issues, but I want to just come stateside for a moment. We have uh, a little under uh, nine minutes uh, to discuss, and this has always been, Ambassador, I always enjoy uh, having an opportunity to have a conversation with you, even though we're seven hours apart from each other. Uh, but, I, but to have the rabbi join us in this program, I hope that when we do it in the future, we can have this triumphant uh, uh, once again in order to be able to do this. But there has been a lot going on, at, at least in the States. I haven't followed it internationally uh, as far as hate crimes in many different ways. And I know that there have been uh, uh, a plethora of issues around uh, hate crimes uh, towards uh, uh, Jewish persons. Uh, certainly there have been in terms of with uh, African-Americans. Uh, but I know recently here we've had an incident where there was SWAT stickers and graffiti at the, in the in the local schools. Uh, you know, if you, first rabbi, would want to speak to that, and then the ambassador from it's from the around the world. Uh, you know, I followed the different groups that track this, and they're saying that there has been a heightening of this. Has that been your experience, either one of you? Well, I, I'll tell you, I came to town in August of 1996. And I remember after I had signed my contract to move up here from Connecticut, uh, I called the uh, president of the synagogue, I don't know, it was about two or three weeks before I came up here, and I said, so tell me, what are you going to do about the swastika that was painted on the school door of the synagogue? Rabbi, how'd you find out about that? I said, well, it was in the Boston Globe by a family up in Boston. Did you think I wasn't going to find out about this? <laughs> So they, I only bring that up because, um, you know, this has been an ongoing problem here in Stoughton. So it's not just simply, you know, swastikas uh, daubed in chalk in front of the O'Donnell Middle School. This, is, this has been something that has 
you know, waxed and waned over the years here in Stoughton. The FBI, as you know, its most recent statistics still show that the prevalence of anti uh, hate crimes against Jews far exceeds percentage wise on a per capita basis any other group in the United States. Um, hate crimes against Jews approach the level of 60% of all hate crimes in the United States. Okay? That's just, that's just an FBI statistic. It's an FBI fact. And I know Southern Poverty Law Center keeps those similar types of statistics as well. Southern Poverty Law Center. I wouldn't rely upon the Southern Poverty Law Center for anything, okay? I would rely on the FBI statistics in mm -hmm. this regard, okay? I would rely upon statistics that are compiled by our local police departments and whatnot because those stats, hard fact stats, are what's reported, then reported to the FBI, okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, you, you know, and then on top of that, you, you speak to what's happening inter globally, internationally. You take a look at how Jewish communities in Europe are now endangered right. by this recrudescence of anti-Semitism in Europe. You know, existentially, you, you know, it, who knows what's going to happen. I think we take a look at France, what's happened in France over the past several years, and the increase of Jewish immigration, French Jewish immigration to Israel, um, it's, it's skyrocketed over the past five years. And indeed, France used to have a Jewish population of 550,000 Jews nationally in France. Okay, the estimates now are down to 450,000. And I think you're going to see that kind of movement of Jews out of Europe, you know, maybe even on a larger scale over the next decade. Ambassador, can you speak to that trend that the rabbi is speaking to as far as anti-Jewism -Jew uh, throughout the world? Well, what I would like to do maybe is shed light on another aspect of hate education. We spoke about uh, Iran, the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran. Their curriculum, since they took over in 1979, sadly, sadly, in a very unbelievable way, uh, with the help of then uh, President Jimmy Carter, who assumed that uh, the Ayatollahs represent uh, justice and morality. But the minute they came to Tehran and assumed power, they instituted curriculum which still predominates Iranian schools until today. It's hate America education. And the U.S. is depicted in classes K through 12 and in the uh, government controlled media as the great Satan. And the people are urging to do their best to cause the downfall of that great Satan uh, during the war uh, between uh, uh, Iran and uh, Iraq. Uh, those kids who were brainwashed by hate education were brainwashed by those days hate Iraq education and they were urged literally to clear uh, minefields with their own bodies and they exploded according to the Ayatollahs to heaven and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of kids who were urged by this hateful regime which expressed us its true, authentic worldview through hate curriculum. The same thing, but on a much lower scale, we experience here with the hate curriculum operated, instituted by the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the Palestinian Authority was installed in 1993, and as soon as they installed themselves in uh, Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank, they also installed hate education. And once again, they urge K through 12 to combat Jews in uh, Israel. They, uh, the youngsters are promised to reach heaven and 72 virgins if they succeed to murder uh, Jews. And this is not limited only to curriculum. It's being re reverberated in 
the mosques on uh, sa- on Friday uh, sermons. It's being reverberated through official monuments in towns uh, which are controlled by the Palestinian Authority. And most devastatingly, it's being reverberated through subsidies paid by the Palestinian Authority to families of terrorists in order to send a message to the Palestinian masses. Terrorism means service of God. You must be knowing that my time must be drawing nigh. I know the rabbi has a comment and that I'm going to have to bring this great discussion to a close, which I regret, but we're going to have to do that. So, Rabbi? Listen, and and if people want to learn more about uh, curriculum and what's being taught in the school systems, it's very simple. Uh, Palestinian Media Watch is a great resource. They uh, translate a whole swath of this material for the English reading public. It's pmw.org.il. They're absolutely terrific. Um, Americans for Peace for Tolerance has, has gotten a hold of curriculum materials that were used in the, in the school systems in Syria. So we know what was being taught in the Syrian school system, and it's just absolutely frightful. And with regard to Iran, I have a sister-in-law who had actually was born in Tehran. And she said when she was growing up in school, she said it's not that things were great for Jews, and she's not Jewish. Okay, not that things were great for Jews and other minorities in Iran, she said, but it wasn't governmental policy. And I'm going to have to end there. We are wrapping. Ambassador, as always, it's a pleasure having you, uh, having this discussion with you. Rabbi, thank you for joining us. Uh, viewing audience, please take a look at the what the rabbi has mentioned as far as a, a website you can go through. I ask you to look at the Ettinger re, uh, reports produced by Ambassador um, uh, Ettinger. And I want to thank you both for being on the program. It has been illuminating. In fact, I couldn't even have any sponsors on today. But <laughs> nonetheless, I say to our sponsors, this is the type of program that you do want to see here on Community Forum, and that's why we want to bring it to you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.